Hello, WinCam. Welcome, Winchester and surrounding communities, Woburn, and we're on live. And tonight, right after my monologue, we're going to talk to Roy Scranton. I, I got that right. Scranton and Matt Gallagher, the return of Matt Gallagher. But as you know, the views and opinions on Visual Radio Live are those of the host and his guests, and not necessarily those of the WinCam board of directors, staff, management, members, viewing audience and whatever. It's our opinions, darn it. And we get to say them. Um, I put black here because we lost the, the great Alvin Lee yesterday. I can't believe it. Um, in 1992, it was my honor to drive Alvin Lee around Massachusetts um, with his song, Real Life Blues, which featured George Harrison of the Beatles and uh, John Lord of Deep Purple, and we've lost them all. It's a tremendous, tremendous track called Real Life Blues. It was from the Zoom album, and you can go on YouTube and hear it for free. Real Life Blues, Alvin Lee. In, in honor of Alvin, please play it, because he was the fastest guitarist before Ingve Malmsteen. At Woodstock, if you watch the Woodstock movie, he was like going home. It made him famous that he was so fast on the guitar. And he kind of opened that whole thing of uh, fastest guitar in the West thing. I see. But real life blues was him playing slow blues, which is the real difficult thing to do. And George Harrison's slide, oh, it's just gorgeous. What an honor for me to have, you know, that record. It was just so good. So here we are. Thank you for letting me give our little tribute to Alvin. And Matt, you're back. I am. Thanks, thanks again for having me. It's great having you here. It's been, uh, what, three years now? Since Kaboom. Yes. I can't believe that. Ah, uh, yeah, time flies. Man, because we've, we've done over 150 shows since you were here last. <laughs> I mean, so it becomes a blur to me. Yeah, I, I can imagine. You know, um, I thought we had Gallagher back here tonight, but it's Matt Gallagher. <laughs> distant cousin, distant cousin. <laughs> I, Irish I, people aren't good at many things, but we do breed well. I, are you related to him, do you think? Uh, not not in, any, in any lineage that I, I'm aware of. And uh, you're a lot more serious than Gallagher. I, I, I'd, I'd like to think so, but uh, you, know, you know, all comedians have, have a dark side, so, so perhaps we're not giving him his due credit. You know, you had asked off camera about um, Gilbert Godfrey. Gilbert is very demure and, and, you know, very polite, and Gallagher's just Gallagher all the time. Mm, okay. So it's funny, Gallagher is uh, just, that's him. That's how he is, and take him or leave him. Gilbert, there's two sides. I see. Very polite man. So... Kaboom. Where did that take you? Right. Uh, yeah. For um, viewers who aren't familiar with Kaboom, uh, it's a, uh, it was a nonfiction memoir that I wrote in 2010 uh, about my experiences in Iraq uh, during the surge. Uh, I was with the Army as a scout platoon leader. Uh, it uh, you know, took me places I didn't really know existed. Uh, you know, I'd moved to New York uh, right after I got out of the Army and, uh, uh, and, and wrote the book. And uh, it kind of opened... O opened me, opened my eyes to a world that uh, 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 that was much vast, uh, much more rich and, and vast, uh, and, and and profound and challenging than I had ever dreamed of, and, and, and that was uh, that that was the writing world. Uh, from there, uh, I decided to go back to school for writing, uh, to grad school for uh, uh, to get a creative writing degree in, in MFA, uh, which I'm finishing this spring, uh, and uh, uh, I'm now I'm now writing fiction. Uh, which is uh, what led me to uh, uh, both short stories uh, and ultimately to uh, uh, this, this new project of ours that I co-edited with Roy uh, called Fire and Forget. Now, did you meet him in the Army? No, uh, we were actually uh, it, it both in the Army but at different times. Uh, I met him, we, we all met at the uh, uh, NYU Veterans Writing Workshop, which uh, was hosted wow. uh, by New York University every Saturday. Uh, Thanks to the generosity of uh, Ambas Ambassador Gene Kennedy Smith, uh, and it just brought together, um, you know, a group of people that that had a lot of uh, a lot of similarities, a lot of differences, um, but two main things I think binded them, which uh, one of which was uh, their experience overseas in Iraq or Afghanistan, but the second was uh, a very serious interest a serious interest in writing and literature. Um, we weren't there for therapy. We, uh, we weren't there for cathartic output. We were there to get better as writers. And I think that was a very, very important thing for all of us at, at that point in our lives. So how did you find Matt, or how did Matt find you at this event? 
at the NYU uh, Vets Writers Group. Well, actually, we I remember the the very first time we met. Uh, I was it was at a panel oh, at right, yeah. at Brooklyn Technical yeah. Bro Brooklyn College, one of the Brooklyn College places. I was on a panel with Colby Bazell and Kayla Williams and some other people, um, Rudy Reyes, and Matt was in the audience and asked a great, uh, just a, a really great question. And we talked to him afterwards and said, hey, you know, we do this, we're at this writing group in, in NYU, and you should come. And then he did. And that's how, that's sort of how the meeting actually happened. Um, yeah. And then he had Kaboom out. He had Kaboom out. Which is Kaboom.com? Uh, kaboombook.com. Okay, thank you. Kaboombook.com. I should remember that, but it's been three years. I, I, I'll forgive you. Okay. And so, how did the idea for the short stories, Fire and Forget, come together? Well, that, that started uh, because some of us in the Vets Writing Group at, at NYU were trading our stories back and forth, and we, you know, we looked at what we had, and we, we realized that there really was like there, there was just something happening in the stories that we were writing. Maybe it was in the moment, maybe it was in uh, what, what we were doing, maybe it was in the community that we, we built. Whatever it was, we, we had something there. And we decided that we needed to get our stories out there and, and we thought, it's not just us. There's, there's got to be other people out there doing this. And so we just decided one day, we're going to make this anthology happen. It was in the White Horse Tavern uh, in Greenwich Village in New York. We got together for some beers and and hashed out the idea. And so then we just sent out a call for stories, you know, talked to everyone we knew, we talked to other vets writing groups, um, and, and looked to find just the best, best stories, some of the best voices coming out of these wars that we could find. How many, do you even know the number, how many came in stories? Did you get flooded? Or? It wasn't, a, it, was a, it was a mild flood. There's, there's, you know, the, w w the statistic that's usually thrown out is like one half of one percent of Americans served overseas. So it's a small percentage. And then the percentage of vets who, who write right. is even smaller. And the percentage of vets who write fiction is even smaller. So it's a, it's a really small subset we're, we're already beginning with. Um, but we had a fair number of, of uh, submissions to begin with. And we had to like cut that down and make some hard decisions and argue about what went in and what had to go. And, work with some of our writers uh, over, a, over a long process um, to, to get this final, these final 15 voices. The, yeah, there were uh, two or three stories um, that we, we had to cut in the end that, that uh, could have certainly been in the collection, but yeah. mm -hmm. for whatever, you know, we just had to make those, those hard cuts. Uh, um, but uh, ultimately, I think it was, we, we, we made the group decision that, uh, um, any story that went into the collection, uh, we couldn't do without it. Right. Uh, and that was essentially, I think, our final guideline that we utilized for these final 15. Now, when you toured with Kaboom, you told the story of Kaboom. What do you fellows do? Like tomorrow night, you're at the Harvard Coop. Harvard Bookstore. The Harvard, Harvard Bookstore. Which used to be the Harvard Coop, uh, I think. Okay, okay. Oh, is okay. the Harvard Bookstore, is it like Barnes & Noble owns it? No, I think it's, I I think it's an independent, independent, independent bookstore I at My 7 p.m. Harvard Bookstore in Cambridge. Do you know the uh, address? Harvard Bookstore. I don't. You Harvard can Google, Bookstore. It's free. Yeah. It's a free lecture, so Google Harvard Bookstore. My bad. It's not the Harvard Coop. Uh, 7 p.m. Uh, 7 p.m. Tomorrow night. It's probably diagonal right across the street because there is another bookstore. Mm. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure I've taped it, both of them. But you've got to forgive me. I've got Blueheimers. So. <laughs> um, so the Harvard Bookstore, so when you're doing these bookstore events where it's a compilation, how do you present it? The two of you are speaking? Well, the, t the two of us, I, the two, Roy and I are the two uh, uh, editors on the cover, but there were actually five of us that kind of helped shape uh, uh, the projection and, and planning and editing of, of the manuscript as a whole. And, and I think it's simply a matter of, of presenting it as, uh, it's you know, not my story or Roy's story, mm -hmm. it's, it's 15 short stories of, of, of fiction, of art, uh, that, that kind of run the gamut of of, uh, of these of these wars. You know, t uh, two wars over t ten plus years. You're going to get a, a vast array of experiences. Uh, just to give viewers kind of an idea of, of of that gamut. You know, on one end of the spectrum, we have a story called Raid by Ted Janis, who, who's a young writer 
uh, uh, originally from Connecticut, uh, that uh, uh, is, is about a uh, midnight raid in Afghanistan, told, told from a perspective of a medic in, in the Army Rangers. Uh, it's exactly what, you, what you'd think of from a raid. It's, it's, it's a lot of action, a lot of momentum, uh, but, but also very artfully told. On the other end, we have a story called uh, uh, Tips for a Smooth Transition by the writer uh, Siobhan Fallon, who, who uh, has a much celebrated short story collection of her own. And, and that's a story set in Hawaii, uh, told from the perspective of a, a, a young military wife uh, who's uh, uh, welcoming her husband back home from war uh, and uh, uh, not really sure uh, how to do that. Uh, uh, and, and it kind of makes a mockery of, of the, the standard uh, written guidelines that, are, that, have, that this narrator's been given. Uh, and we have everything uh, in, in between that to, that really kind of uh, each serve as different touchstones for experiences for service members and their families over the, over the course of these wars. And the way it typically works at an event, say like tomorrow night at the Harvard Bookstore, uh, is that Matt or I will say a few introductory remarks, we'll talk a little bit about how the, the anthology came together and maybe touch on some of the, some of the difficulties one faces in, in turning uh, experiences for more or taking experiences for more and, and building fiction out of those. Mm -hmm. But then what we prefer to do is to step back at that point and have some people read excerpts from their stories. So let those voices, let those stories step uh, center stage. For example, tomorrow night we have Colby Bazell, uh, who's uh, best known for his memoir, My War, but he's got a short story in our collection, uh, Play the Game, about a, a returned vet who's uh, sort of thrown out on the, on the recession job market with only his infantry skills to to get him, you know, uh, take him through. Um, we have Colby and uh, Siobhan Fallon, who Matt mentioned. Uh, they'll both be reading, uh, along with myself and Matt, so. Oh, so you all get to read? We'll, yeah, we read excerpts from the stories. That's, yeah. that's really awesome. Yeah. Um, that's a big entourage. Do you, do you all tour together, or do different people come to different events? Different people come to different events. Roy and I generally make most, you know, one, one of, of us, us is well, at everything. Right. Yeah. yeah. One of us has to be at everything, but and then you know, depending, you know, we have vets from all over. Uh, we also two of our contributors. One, one lives live abroad currently. Uh, one Roman Skaskiu uh, lives in uh, the Ukraine right now. Uh, another one, Andrew Slater, who's a former Green Beret, is actually teaching English in Iraq. Yeah. Uh, so uh, no current book events are scheduled for uh, for either of those countries. But if and when that does happen, yeah. uh, we'll have representatives there as well. Ah. And the new Oz, the Great and Powerful, is a Ukraine actress is the Wicked Witch of the uh, West. Ah, that is, ah. I'm sure a lot of Cold War undertones or overtones are, are, are embedded in that. And nobody even knew. Um, I'm not supposed to talk about the movie till midnight tonight. Okay. There's an embargo. But I might by the end of the movie, uh, the, the show. But it's just funny you said Ukraine, and I just did the review like an hour before you guys showed up. Am, oh, I, yeah. am I allowed to ask what you thought? or? Um, yeah, you can ask what I thought. It's um, very expensive, very glitzy, and it looks like they put The Wizard of Oz in Avatar. Ah, okay. Ah. And so uh, you'll see that. Um, there's still a lot of fun elements to it. I mean, it's Oz. Right. And yeah, it's nice to see them putting $200 million into Oz. Yeah. Um, hopefully there'll be more. And James Franco is a, uh, a short story writer himself. That's I did right. not know that. That's right. Yeah, he had a collection called Palo Alto come out yeah. a couple years ago. Yeah, but he's not a vet, is he? He's not. No, he's not. That's oh. the one thing he he hasn't done yet. <laughs> oh well, you know, he's what thirty. Give him time. Give him time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Next now, war. <laughs> I want to ask, who is Colin McCann? Colin McCann is a very generous man and a, and a very brilliant writer uh, that that wrote the introduction for Fire and Forget. Mm -hmm. uh, he won the National Book Award in two thousand ten. Yeah, for Let the Great World Spin. That's right. That's right. And uh, he's 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 an Irishman himself, uh, and he's been. Uh, uh, instrumental in, in this process of, of what was originally a bar napkin idea, right. as, as Roy described earlier, yeah. and, and to seeing this to an actual product. Uh, Co Colm's yeah. Colum's been there throughout. He's, he's been incredibly supportive the whole time. Is he a veteran? He's not. He's, he's not. not. No, but he's, you know, Irish and, and you know, being, being Irish and from, from the northern, not Northern Ireland, but the northern end of Ireland, you know, the, the people there have been familiar with conflict for a long time. Oh, yeah, yeah. Not that it's, a, you know, a requisite for someone writing the forward, no. but I just, right. you know, no. wanted to ask. Of course. Um, 
I, I'm so happy that you're here because it's, it's, it's I love hashing it out and we, we get about 45 minutes, so that's good. Mm -hmm. I, I like to explore different elements of the book. The cover, and Matt knows I love to talk about the covers. Mm -hmm. um, how did that come to be? It's, it's really good. I like the, the, the text and the, the uh, imagery. Right, yeah. right, yeah, it was, there was a long back and forth as covers often often are uh, uh, that involve uh, you know the editorial side of uh, of a publisher the the marketing side uh, the art art side and and, and sometimes you know, uh, you know we, we were lucky enough to be included in in the process as well which is not often the case with writers right. ultimately I, I think what this cover captures uh, uh, better than anything is um, kind of the open-ended nature of uh, of war, um, not just on an individual, but but on a terrain, on a country, on a people. Uh, you know, it's got this bright blue sky um, that is, you know, often such a symbol for for kind of happiness. Uh, but uh, but it has these these war machines, you know, rolling through the desert, uh, kicking up clouds of dust that uh, that aren't temporary. And, and it, it, you know, for me, it resonated because uh, when I was in the army, war was something that I would go do and then I'd be done with and, and my experience both as a veteran and as a and as a veteran writer is is has shown me otherwise that it's, it's it's not part of who I am it's embedded it, it's embedded in me uh, the same way it's in, it's been embedded in the in, in the people in the the land and the terrain of Iraq and Afghanistan um, it, it's not just something that that ends uh, when we set a date on it and one of the things I really love about the cover is that there are multiple trucks there's a whole convoy that, that we're only catching a glimpse of. And even, even the people driving these trucks, I, mean, I was a Humvee driver myself in Iraq, uh, 2003 to 2004, so I've been on convoys just like this. Uh, and when you're in that position behind the wheel and there's all this dust coming up, you can't actually see where you're going. You're just blindly following the, 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 the taillights in front of you. And there's, a, there's an extreme sense of not having any idea of what the big picture is. You just have your little, your little window. But, there's, but each truck has its own little window. And part of our vision for Fire and Forget that I think is sort of embodied in this, in this cover is that, is that you're not just getting one window. You're not just getting one story because, because the war is not one story. You're getting, you're getting this little window like with Raid or like with uh, Gavin Kovite's story, uh, uh, When Engaging Targets Remember, uh, which puts you in the gunner's hatch of a Humvee, uh, then you're getting another little window. Uh, like, um, I don't know, Brian Turner's uh, The Wave That Takes Them Under, which, which puts you uh, it, with an infantry patrol uh, on foot uh, going across some, some sand dunes, uh, and they have a, there's a combat incident. Um, and then you get another little window and another little window. And that, that sort of uh, multiplicity, the kaleidoscopic view of war, was, was really, really important to, to putting this book together. So you were in the Humvee? Yeah. What did you do in the Humvee? I was a driver. I was actually, my job in the military was a fire direction control for the multiple launch rocket system. So what I was trained to do, Joe, was to sit behind a computer and tell this giant rocket launcher where to shoot rockets. And then we went to Iraq, and they're like, you get to drive a Humvee because we're just going to do patrols, and we're going to go, uh, we're going to drive around, we're going to kick in doors, we're going to drive around Baghdad and pick up uh, old Iraqi munitions and then blow them up. Uh, so that's what I did. So when you talk about the, um, the dust storms, yeah. uh, is it kind of like Captain Kirk being chased by a Khan in the Motaran Nebula in the Wrath of Khan? Remember when they couldn't yeah. see in front of them? Mm -hmm. And you're waiting for those little tail lights? Yeah. They, they I, I had actually I had thought of that when I was downrange. I thought of that moment in, in the Wrath of Khan. They, they, call, them, they, call, it, uh, they call it Samums. It's uh, the, poison, the poison wind yeah. uh, over there. And there's a season where everything... Uh, we were in a similar part, uh, ce central Iraq, where everything uh, for hours on end in the middle of the day would just turn orange. Yeah. So yeah, I'm psychic and I read minds, but don't tell <laughs> anyone. Um, so if you do this with the book, you've got like almost the planet Mars and there's almost another yeah. metaphor there. Yeah, yeah. Of the uh, that's Star exactly, Wars. That's exactly right. The, yeah. the metaphor of the, the distance of how far away these wars are from 
our lives here. Mm -hmm. It's all, it's just, you know, you might as well be on Mars. Well, what we got to do is we got to get you guys to just be the patrol guys and we got to stop war. So if we go to Mars, we don't have Star Wars. We have just you guys do the, you know, and uh, the people you train do the patrol work. Right. And just keep everyone safe. Like an alien, the, the space marines. <laughs> you know? Uh, yeah, because you never know what, um, you know, that's, that's one of the things of science fiction, that all this war going on, if there's a bigger threat, an asteroid coming at us, it doesn't even have to be a living threat, an asteroid coming at us. In science fiction, the theme is the world comes together because we all must fight, or we all go. Right. Mm -hmm. So we all, right. you know, a, a bigger threat can bring us to that tipping point where we either survive or we don't. And... Uh, but it's, it's, it's a fascinating world for me because uh, no one ever thinks of veterans becoming writers. You think of writers like nerds like me, just, you know, mm. stuck at the computer, you know, writing my Wizard of Oz reviews or whatever. Well, it's interesting you should talk about science fiction. Robert Heinlein was a vet. Uh, I didn't he, know that. He was, a, he was a sailor in World War II. Uh, Joe Haldeman, who wrote The Forever War, mm -hmm. Vietnam vet, uh, and then wrote a, a well-known uh, science fiction novel, that some people view as an allegory of Vietnam. Um, there's uh, Rob Robert Jordan, the author of the uh, uh, Wheel of Time series, went to the Citadel. So yeah. while you're incredibly busy as soldiers, there's probably some time that's downtime and you need something to do, and there's pen and pad. Did you, you were writing over there for Kaboom. I was, I was. Um, you know, it was initially a blog uh, that, I, that I kept uh, to keep my family and friends apprised of what, what I was experiencing and seeing over there. Uh, certainly there were uh, cathartic aspects of, of the blogging uh, that, that filtered into my writing. Um, but but uh, you know, when, I, when I came back and, and, and turned Kaboom into a book, and, and certainly with my writing now, um, it, it's, it's, it's different. It's, it's, you know, I may, Henry James called them germs, you know, germs from real life that you hmm. can use and turn into a story. Uh, uh, but, but ju no, nothing more than that, um, uh, or, or you know, taking two com completely di disparate memories uh, and experiences uh, and, and melding them together, mm -hmm. and then letting the story uh, 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 f uh, develop from there has, has proven to be a, um, a beneficial thing for me a as I've developed as a writer. Um, you know, the, just, just because it's, that's the way it happened, um, you know, that's, that's what, how you write in a nonfiction. In fiction, uh, that, that doesn't work. Uh, mm -hmm. it, everything must serve the story. Mm -hmm. uh, and and it's, been a, it's been an important thing to, to cultivate that and, and to remember that as, as, I've, as I've made the transition these past couple of years. You know, it's funny touching the book and, and the feel of it and seeing all the authors in the back. It reminds me of, like you say, Robert Heinlein. I believe he wrote for the Pulps back mm -hmm. in the 50s. Okay. And they would get like maybe a nickel a word or a penny a word. And so the more words they wrote, the more money they got paid mm -hmm. for these science fiction anthologies, mm -hmm. which were like Fate magazine or they had all these pulp magazines that they wrote for. Yeah. And then a lot of the stories, um, there's a wonderful press here in Cambridge um, that came out of the Boscone conventions. I'm going to bring up conventions next. Uh, the Boston Science Fiction Conventions. We have a reader con happening in June here at the Burlington Marriott. It's been going on for like 18 years. So the science fiction authors come into Burlington. Okay. And they have panels and they talk. Science fiction, the pulp writers, they'd, they'd be the compilations. Now what's really fascinating is you wouldn't think of a Heinlein title going out of print, right? Mm -hmm. One would think they're just perpetual. Right. But a lot of these guys, they wrote so many books, the stuff is going out of print. Yeah. So the Boscone Convention, I believe I'm correct in this, because I've interviewed them, they created a publishing company that's doing marvelous uh, resurrecting of these old books, beautiful new covers. Uh, it's pretty stunning, and they're at these shows. Okay. My next question to you guys is, the Book Expo America is the end of May, May 30th. Okay, mm -hmm. right. Are you going to be at that event? I don't know if we will be. We probably should be. I'm sure DeCapo will be there. Right. It's um, a big, big book event yeah. that happens annually. Yeah. Um, Actually, I think we might be on the road. May 30th? May 30th. I think we're going to be... It's like Memorial Day. Yeah. We're, um, we're going to be driving back from... We have a big book a, event in Austin, Texas. In Austin, Texas on uh, 20... Uh, toward the end of the, May. Do you know um, what it is in Texas, the event? In Austin. Yeah, do you know the name of it? 
Uh, book people. Book people. I've not heard of that. Yeah. Wow. It's, yeah, yeah, it's an excellent bookstore down there, and, yeah. and uh, it, it's it's actually uh, we're really looking forward to it. It's it's uh, uh, five of us, five of the contributors are are, are pulling yeah. together uh, uh, some funds uh, that we've made from some readings. Uh, and, and are running a car and uh, mm -hmm. you're going to drive dr dr drive, drive driving down to Texas uh, by, by way of New Orleans and, and Nashville. So I, I think uh, some maybe some future short stories will come out of that week because <laughs> it should prove an eventful right. time for for all of us. Now One that thing. takes discipline, which a soldier <laughs> yeah. has. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Um, yeah. so, soldiers and Marines. It'll be a group of soldiers and Marines. So I'm and sure Marines, that, and Marines. Yeah, yeah. I would say, guys, I'm flying. I'll see you there. <laughs> One thing that's exciting about it is that uh, one of our contributors uh, lives down there in Austin, so oh. he'll be there to meet with us, Brian Van Reet. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. You know, we put out the call, and we have writers, Matt mentioned, uh, in Ukraine and in, now in Iraq, back in Iraq. Um, and we have writers that uh, some, not, some of us have never met all, all over the country. Virtual, uh, by well, email and right, whatever. Right, right. Um, for example, uh, in, in two weeks, I'm going out west, uh, and I'll be doing readings at uh, Powell's and Elliott Bay with uh, David Abrams, who wrote the novel Fobbit, and uh, one of the stories in Fire and Forget, Roll Call. And where's that? Uh, it's uh, in Portland, Oregon, and oh, Seattle, Washington. Really far yeah. up there. Uh, and also, uh, Gavin Kovite's going to be there with us um, March 20th and 21st, which are... March 20th, of course, the 10-year anniversary of the invasion of Iraq. Important date we should take note of. Which is, um, again, March 20th. March 20th, yeah. Yeah. Which is uh, uh, hard to believe it's been a decade. It really is. It really is. Well, significant to me, um, my friend Bobby Hebb wrote the song Sunny. And we have a, a colleague in Germany. Uh, and he flew Bobby over the week of the Iraq war. I mean, we didn't know about this, mm -hmm. yeah. but he recorded his album over there. That's yeah. all I want to know. So it sticks in my head that, you know, so it's, yeah. the, tenth year, so it's the tenth year anniversary now of that album being made. Yeah. It's, 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 um, but thank you for bringing that up. You know, one, yeah. one, one thing uh, Roy mentioned that I kind of want to, uh, I think is fascinating about, about our world now is, is uh, you know, We've edited many of these people's stories, and we're yeah. only now getting, you know, as we travel, getting to meet them in person. But you, you know, I feel like I've I've known them intimately for for right. uh, for two, three years, right? Because you know, you, you get into somebody's work uh, and 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 start shape helping shape it and edit it and gently suggest they change it or not so gently suggest they they ch they change it. Uh, uh, you get to know somebody very very quickly on a very personal level. So uh, you know. The wonders of technology, uh, uh, fire, and for, fire and Forget, is certainly a product of that. Uh, yeah. Well, as an editor, you, it's very personal when you're reading someone's personal writing. So you get to know each individual in a way that even some of their closest friends don't know them because you're getting insight as a writer yourself as to what they're all about right. in a way. Yeah, right. not just because it's their fiction, not just who they are, what they project, but, but what they dream about, how, how they... Uh, 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 how they can create characters and, and create worlds uh, almost on a deeper level than, than if it was just kind of memoir writing. Yeah, and you get, you get into their sentences and their language and the way that the, the rhythms of their speech hold together. It's, it's really interesting, you know, because sometimes you can, you, know, you can see something in someone's story and, and you don't think it works, um, but for them, you know, that's just the way, that's the, way the world sounds. Mm -hmm. You know, and sometimes, uh, you know, sometimes people have to nudge toward making, making, you know, changing it so that other people can understand it. And some people, sometimes people have to, like, nudge more toward getting the world to understand the way they hear it. It goes back and forth different ways. That's the whole key to it, isn't it? The personality. So yeah. there's distinct personalities that come out in an anthology that wouldn't in a personal book like Kaboom. Sure. Yeah. I, you know, it's just a uh, you know, Kaboom was a 15 month snapshot. You know, 15 months is a long time, but it is still a very small slice of the Iraq War as a whole. And it's mostly from your eyes. Exactly. Limited, limited by what I saw, uh, my my own worldview, my age at the time, uh, 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 all of those things. And, and uh, Roy mentioned, you know, I think kaleidoscope is the perfect word for describing what we were trying to accomplish with Fire and Forget. One yeah. of the, one of the most distinct voices. I mean, they're all distinct, um, but. 
just as an example, I guess I would I would point to uh, Perry O'Brien's story yeah. Poughkeepsie, uh, which tells the story of a of a veteran who we're not exactly sure in the story. You're not exactly sure what his situation is, but it's clear he's been downrange and he's back now. But he's at a bus station and he's going to track down a girl who wrote him a letter uh, when he was overseas. But she didn't write him a letter when, she was, when he was overseas. She wrote an anonymous letter supporting the troops. Ah. And now he's gonna go to her college because he knows she loves him. It's a little bit weird and it's, and it's a little bit, uh, you know, it's a little bit jangly and it's a little bit uh, surreal. Surreal, yeah. And Perry just nails it with the language, uh, with the way he puts sentences together and, and his choice of descriptions. Uh, it's a really distinct, distinct and unusual voice. And at the end of the book, you have uh, the contributors. So everyone has a little paragraph. So you get to know a little bit more about Royce Granton's poetry, fiction, and essays have appeared in Boston Review, the Massachusetts Review, Denver Quarterly, LIT, New Letters, New York Times, and elsewhere. He's earned an MA from the New School for Social Research and is currently a PhD candidate in English at Princeton. That's right. That's pretty impressive. I've been lucky. I've been lucky and worked hard and yeah. I have two questions. I want, it was funny because I was going to ask about if you knew of any dreams that became the fiction book and then you said mm -hmm. well, what they dream about and I thought it was really mind reading again. <laughs> Were there any, anyone say to you, hey, I had this dream about this and, I, and it was the germ of the idea? Uh, for, for putting together the collection? Oh, no, no, the, the one story, just the uh, one story. The one story, well, it, you know, uh, the one story that, that comes to mind immediately is, is, is entitled New Me. Mm -hmm. It's by uh, Andrew Slater, who, who I mentioned earlier, uh, is a former Green Beret. And uh, uh, it's, no, I'm, I'm friends with Andrew, so it's, I, I don't think it's lifted directly from his life, but I, I think there are germs of, 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 uh, from his own life or, or people that he knew. It's about a, uh, a veteran that suffered a very serious traumatic brain injury due to a roadside bomb attack uh, oh. in Iraq. And it, it takes place back here, and uh, as he's trying to literally uh, piece together uh, his life uh, and, and what he remembers and, and, and what he can do going forward, uh, and it, that seems really down and depressing. But he does it. He, he has kind of this light, humorous touch, uh, uh, completely, um, uh, completely free of pity, uh, that, that makes the story go. Uh, and, and dreams, dreams play a huge, huge role in that story and, and, and its momentum. I was only wondering because it's so uh, dynamic and sometimes traumatic when a bomb goes off down the street, and I would think that to be, there'd be recurring dreams for some of the writers. I think, you know, that's, that's certainly the case. A, a lot of the stories in Fire and Forget deal with how to remember war, how to carry it forward, how to, how to think about it, how to, and sometimes how to let it go. Uh, one example might be uh, Mariette Kalinowski's story, The Train, uh, which is about a, a young Marine woman uh, who is returned to New York City and she rides a subway train back and forth all the time um, because she's trying to deal with a memory she has of the day she was on guard duty when uh, she watched her best friend get blown up uh, by a suicide bomber. Uh, and she, she thinks back to the, to the moment when she realized that that guy in line had something funny about him and she didn't move quick enough. And then he blew up. And she can't let that go. She's stuck there, riding that train, riding that train. And that story, you know, that story is about, about that process of how to remember and, and how to let go. And sometimes humans find it very difficult, very difficult to let go. Mm -hmm. um, I appreciate your service and I thank you for your service um, because you guys keep us safe and we need an army. Um, sometimes I can't let go of the fact that like, why did we have to go there in the first place? Why couldn't we have Fine worked question. with <laughs> the Iraqis and the Afghans too? And here, here's, um, instead of a threat coming from an asteroid, Here's something I thought we should have done without a threat. The Mir space station, I always thought, why couldn't we get 20 or 30 countries to pool their resources and try to take Mir 
and landed on the moon. Mm -hmm. And the reason being is we've got this like $100 million, $200 million. It's like the cost of the, the Oz movie, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Piece of equipment that we could learn something moving it out of Earth's orbit to the moon, whatever process, and if it takes 10 years, fine. We're all working together as a team, as scientists, because we create a junkyard on the moon with all the space debris we have, and then when we build our colonies, we have stuff yeah. that might serve a purpose that we can if build with. an asteroid hits and they need a place to run quickly, there's yeah. the old space station. Right. Uh, so this is just an idea of like how to avoid war. Well, if we had all said, hey, instead of going to war, let's all be friends and do this, mm -hmm. but maybe we'll reach an enlightened state sometimes. Not to take away at all from what you did to help us stay safe, which we appreciate. No, yeah, I, I, th I, think, I think most, most veterans, um, if, they, if they haven't done it during their time of service, certainly have to confront um, uh, the big questions of why and how uh, mm -hmm. once they return. I, I think that's an important yeah. part of the tran transitional yeah. process. Yeah, it's interesting that it's an all-volunteer force. Uh, you know, nobody, nobody drafted any of us. Nobody Which is why we didn't have what I saw, because I got my draft card at like 18, and yeah. I was scared. Right. Yeah. So, and it was a different time. It was yeah. a whole different feel. Right. I'm sure it was. And it was a different war, too. Um, you know, but, uh, so it, we were an all-volunteer force. But that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, that when you sign on for the military, that you sign on for the decisions that get made by the people who tell you where to go. Um, there's a, you know, a lot of people have a lot of different thoughts about that, and uh, had different thoughts about it at the time mm -hmm. um, and continue to, to think about what it meant and, and how it matters. Um, yeah, it's a heavy question. It's a heavy question. One question I do have, um, you know I love public access TV. As you fellows go around the country, have you thought of calling up the access stations, like the CCTV in Cambridge? Mm -hmm. I'm a member there. Uh, like someone should be taping the event tomorrow night. Mm -hmm. And then like you kept the blog for Kaboom, mm -hmm. you keep a video blog of your travels around the country. Yeah, the, the, one of the great parts of, of book life is, is uh, uh, DeCapo's uh, wonderful publicist deals with all of that for us. Right. So, so uh, we, go, we go where she tells us to go. Yeah. And she's wonderful. She, she's great, she's been she? to this studio. Yeah. No, but it's just an idea and maybe I'll run it by her because it'd be really nice to see you guys on the road and, and the access stations are in a lot of communities. Mm -hmm. we, are, we are running around and trying to do everything we can. I talked to Carl Helliker and Book Chat in Pennsylvania. We just talked to the Pentagon Channel earlier today. Whoa. Um, Matt's now, where'd you do that from? An ISDN line somewhere? Or? Skype. We Skype. We <laughs> did a Skype interview. Yeah. <laughs> it was a new experience. Low tech. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, you know... Um, this, this company's out there doing this telepresence thing. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, people say to me, do you have Skype? And other, some publishers are saying, oh, do you, you know, do you have an ISDN line? And they're like, we don't. We're public right. access. You know, we're going to yeah. talk to Del Estrito via phone uh, and my microphone, but it works. Uh, so, you know, you do what you can. But, so what does the Pentagon news channel? The Pentagon channel. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do they go overseas as well? They, they must, they I'm must. sure. Yeah. They I, must all be online. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, it'll be on. And then they, they're on TV, so they're on cable. Yeah. It's certainly in Northern Virginia. Uh, I know my brother lives in D.C., and, and, and they get the Pentagon Channel. Mm -hmm. um, oh. Uh, so, yeah. No, it's, 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 you know, it's, it's, Roy and I were joking earlier, yeah. uh, you know, because I, uh, I was a young lieutenant when, when I had a blog overseas, and it got shut down um, by, by the powers that be. I, I, I will admit to having a, a, a bit of a daydream of, of having a, 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 some mid-level bureaucrat that, that, that was involved in shutting the blog down, uh, watching the Pentagon Channel tomorrow and, and, and spitting his coffee all over, <laughs> all over his, uh, his TV screen. That'd be I think pretty it, funny. I think it goes out uh, at, at all mili at, or at least I think most military bases. I remember, I remember, I don't remember whether it was when I got to Germany or Fort Sill, but uh, getting to a military base and, and plugging my TV in and all I got was the Pentagon Channel <laughs> because I, in, until I ordered cable. Um, so, well, there is something called the NASA <laughs> <Lucky> Channel, <you. laughs> and for years, public access can tap into the NASA Channel. 
Yeah. So if we have three hours of programming missing tonight, or if a server is down, you can switch to NASA channel. Yeah. And you can you you know it's pretty cool. It's not bad programming. Okay. Yeah. Because it's, it's it might be from the space station. I don't know. Right. Right. We've got about um, eight minutes. Would anyone like to read, or you can both if you'd oh. like, and you don't have to. We can keep. We're having a fun conversation, yeah. so you don't have to. Wait, Roy, why don't you read a little bit from the intro? I think that would be okay. appropriate. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I could read from the intro. From the preface. Yeah. Where's my camera? <clears throat> I don't know if this will take quite eight minutes. We may have to keep. No, talking, no, no. Just a few I'll, minutes. I'll just a couple. And we'll get One, back to talking. All right. One thing Yvette will always tell you is that it's never like it is in the stories. Then he'll tell you his. We convened at the White Horse Tavern under the glum and bleary eyes of Dylan Thomas, Norman Mailer, and Jack Kerouac. It was a warm March day, not spring yet, but with winter fading. Eight years and change since we'd invaded Iraq. Afghanistan loomed shadowy behind that, then 9-11, then the Cold War, Vietnam, Korea, World War II, Pickett's Charge, the Battle of Austerlitz, the conquest of New Spain, Agincourt, Thermopylae, and the Rage of Achilles. Stories upon stories, stories of war. We had our own stories to tell, and in each other had found just the right audience to test the telling. There'd be no BSing, yet we shared among us a subtle understanding that the real truth might never make it on the page. We each knew the problem we all together struggled with, which was how to say something true about an experience unreal to a people fed and wadded about with lies. As Joseph Conrad's Marlowe put it, somewhere in another war on terror, do you see the story? Do you see anything? It seems to me I'm trying to tell you a dream, making a vain attempt because no relation of a dream can convey the dream sensation, that commingling of absurdity, surprise, and bewilderment in a tremor of struggling revolt, the notion of being captured by the incredible, which is the very essence of dreams. There's always that wobble in war between romance and vision, between reality and imagination, between propaganda and what you lean on to survive. Each story has one ending, the same ending, and it can come sudden, silent, unseen, the street blows up under your feet or a sniper gets lucky. Who knows? Meanwhile, home is a place you lived once, a different person, a different life, and all the people you loved somehow alien. You come to depend on the hard matter of things because what's real so quickly goes up in smoke. How do you put that on a page? How do we tell you? How do we capture the totality of the thing in just a handful of words? How do we make something whole from just fragments. We all came from different places and had different wars, but we share a common set of concerns. Good whiskey, great writing, and the challenges and possibilities of making art out of war, and the funny gray zone we found ourselves in, where you shape truths out of fiction pulled out of truth, which might only be the illusion of truth in the first place. We made a date for the White Horse Tavern where this anthology took root. Over the next year, we collected stories, soliciting, nurturing, pruning, trying to put together something we could feel proud of, something if not representative, at least vivid enough to inscribe on the wars our mark, our signature. Truth, truthiness, in this mass media cacophony we live in, comes up something for grabs. Well, here's some. Grab it. We were there. This is what we saw. This is how it felt. And we're here to say, it's not like you heard in the stories. Now that is very good writing. Thanks, John. Did you, both of you come up with the preface? R Roy, that Roy wrote the preface. Very for, nice. For the group. Thanks. Very, very nice. It flows very nicely. It. it explains things. Uh, it's so cool to have this little collection. Have you ever heard of other uh, collections like this, or is this a first? This is the first. This is the first collection of uh, literary fiction by veterans from these wars. That's really extraordinary. Uh, we think so. We think so. There have been, there have been some other uh, collections of veterans' writings, right, such as which Operation I would imagine. Homecoming and, mm -hmm. and other things, poetry and nonfiction and, and different kinds of pieces. But this is the first, first collection of short stories. And, and, and you know, I, I think 
we were partly, I think, inspired by by the past of of, of seeing um, uh, veteran writers from from previous wars, uh, be it the British poets or or, or the Vietnam writers when they first got back, mm -hmm. uh, sharing their writing and getting better and refining each other's writing uh, together, uh, and and, and uh, realizing that that if we wanted to uh, uh, reach our goals and and, and become the writers that we all felt we were capable of, we needed each other to be able to do that. Right. Now, do you have an agent, personally? Uh, uh, for this, we, yeah, for this, we had an, uh, an agent work, work the project. Um, and, and then uh, it's, it's really uh, literary agents are, uh, generally go project to project. Um, and I was wondering if it was your personal relationship with the capo. I, it, it helped. It helped. Yeah. But uh, 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 our our agent was E. J. McCarthy for this, and he worked. Right. He worked tirelessly. He was, he was incredible. He was, he was, uh, you know, fastidious and rigorous and transparent, and just uh, just a f the 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 very model of of a conscientious, hardworking agent. He was great. Very cool. He was really amazing. Yeah. And DeCapo must have just said, "Wow, this is really unique." You know, they, uh, it, was, it was interesting because they, they don't, uh, they, they publish a lot of military nonfiction, um, but it's been a couple years uh, apparently since they published fiction. But, uh, mm -hmm. um, but uh, we had a release party a couple weeks ago, and, and, and our editor uh, uh, came, and, and it, was, it was good to talk to him. And, and uh, it was, you know, it was, it, was, it was close enough to their, their mission purpose that, that, that it made sense. Uh, and it, it would, they believed it would prove beneficial, beneficial for them to publish under their name. We only have well, a couple of minutes. And oh. the publisher's uh, son is a uh, Marine yes, absolutely, as well. Yes. Which, uh, He's in the Marines? The publisher's son, uh, which, you know, it's, it, I think it's something about, the, there's something about this book that strikes people, that especially families of veterans and friends of veterans, uh, because I think there's, there's a way that this book lets people understand that experience uh, in, a, in a way, uh, you know, uh, in a way that doesn't, that's not threatening, you know, it's fiction, so it's a sort of space you can move into uh, and, and imagine and think about. Um, and we've had a lot of response from, from families of veterans and friends mm -hmm. uh, that, that they feel like this book can really help them. We have a couple of minutes left, but I, I do want to say when you put names down to people, it, it's, it kind of puts a face on the veterans because the public here is support the troops veterans of Vietnam War, but they never put a face to who these invisible people are, and you right. never know if they're doing well, if they're not doing well, and this kind of gives you like, oh, these are the troops. Yeah. They now have a, um, each individual has a, has a name. It's something to strike the consciousness of the general public that doesn't really comprehend what goes into war and who are these people that are fighting for us? Right, yeah, yeah I, th I think filling out that silhouette is, is vital. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, it's, a, it's a healthy thing uh, for a democracy. You know, if we have an all-volunteer force, you know, it can, it, it's a tricky thing for, for a democracy to navigate. Uh, uh, and, um, you know, we're, we're not uh, stormtroopers. Uh, you know, we're, uh, uh, you know, if we're not your sons and daughters, we're somebody's sons and daughters. Right, right. and that's important to know. The book is Fire and Forget, edited by Roy Scranton and Mac Gallagher. It's kind of cool that the two editors had another editor editing their editing. We did. That's right. kind of interesting. <laughs> yeah, very, very meta. Wow. <laughs> and the book is uh, fireandforgetbook.com? Correct. Yeah, oh, the, the website, fireandforgetbook.com. And now we're going to talk Alfred Hitchcock. All right. And he, we pretty much covered the ground. Tomorrow night you're at the Harvard Bookstore. Right. 7 p.m. 7, 7 p.m. in Cambridge for it's people free watching us now. And we're going to talk to a guy in Houston. We're going to ask how far Houston is from Austin. Yes. I think it's a couple hours. And when you in it's Austin like again? Two hours. End of May. End of May, yeah. I don't remember Frank the date. Frank Delatrio, talking about movies. Frank, I have two veterans here with me, Roy Scranton and Matt Gallagher. Hey, Frank. Okay, and where did they serve? Uh, we both served in Iraq. All right. And when were we there? I was there 2003 to 2004. And I was there 2007 through 2009. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, glad to have you back. And glad they have a back. book of, um, of, non of, of fiction, fiction stories by veterans, and they're going to be in Austin. Uh, Roy's going to be in Austin. You're both going to be in Austin. We're That's both right. Yes. When? End of May. End of May. End of May. 
And you'll be retired by then, so you can you and your wife can take a trek. That's right. Hey, where where in Austin? We're in Austin. At Book People. Book People. Book People. Okay. Well, a good luck. I I I have done book signings, and they can be they can make you feel like you're a star, or they can make you feel like you're a bum. So, <laughs> good luck to you. Never know what's going to happen. Thanks. Appreciate hey, that. Hey Frank, what's our um, our uh, movie for a week from tonight? Of tomorrow night is uh, the next to last in your Alfred Hitchcock s series. It's The Skin Game, 1931, an early sound film. Hitchcock's fourth talking. And the most important thing that your viewers want to know about is the Hitchcock cameo, and there is no cameo in this movie. He does not appear. No Hitchcock skin in The Skin Game. That's right. His skin is not in the game. It had to be a longer film to get his skin into it. I thought that he just got into the movies because he's so big the camera couldn't miss him. Uh, no, I had nothing, to do. <laughs> I had nothing to do with it. It started off as something he did occasionally, and then uh, once he came to America, I think all, I think all his movies when he came to America had him in them in somewhere. Before that, um, the uh, it's kind of hit or miss. I, I think that the the the, we, the movie we'll be talking about next week has a Hitchcock cameo, but not this one. And which movie is that? Uh, you'll end the series with the. Hitchcock classic, The 39 Steps. Oh, great. So I look forward to speaking with you about that. All right. Um, skin Game. So it's the fourth talkie? It's his, it's his fourth talkie. It's the earliest talkie that you've shown, and, and your viewers will see that. The, um, you know, the Lon Chaney Sr. was a silent film star, and he made a famous quote. He goes, why should I stop making good silent movies and start making bad sound movies? And it took a while for the, uh, the art to catch up with the technology of sound, and then vice versa. They had artists who knew how to make silent films and not know how to make talkie films. And you'll see some of that in here. It's, uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of camera movement and fluidity, but the scenes tend to be long, and there's almost no close-ups in the movie, which is surprising for Hitchcock, because he, he made brilliant use of close-ups, you know, getting people at tense moments and all that, but there's not much of that in this movie. So in, in, that, in that sense, it's kind of a crude technique compared to a lot of things. It is a story of the landed gentry against the newly wealthy or the, the traditional lord of the manor against the new upstart industrialist. And I think the first line of the movie talks about, hey, they're cutting down more trees. And that is the skin game. The skin and the, the, the term has nothing, to, has nothing to do with anything salacious. Uh, you know, the, this one entrenched traditional family sees, uh, sees things should be done the proper way, but it, and the acquisition of land and the transformation of society becomes for the newcomers just a skin game. Whoever has the, the most bucks wins the game. But then the title, is, as it often happens in Hitchcock movies, takes on another meaning, but when these two families really get into it, uh, there's some dirt that's dug up uh, on some of them, and then skin takes on a different meaning. So that says I found it interesting to watch. Uh, you'll, you'll learn more about British divorce laws from the 1930s than you ever thought you'd want to know. Uh, there's not many people in here uh, that viewers will recognize. The, the star of it is Edmund Gwynn, who we see every Christmas time. He played Santa Claus in Miracle on 34th Street, and he was in the horror movie Them, and he was in two other Hitchcock movies. That he, He's quite good in this movie. And... That may be the only person that some of you, that most of your viewers will rec recognize. Uh, there's another actor who you won't recognize, uh, Frank Lawton, who's a young man here. A few years later, he comes to America and he pops up in American movies like David Copperfield, and he starred opposite Lugosi and Karloff in The Invisible Ray. But you don't see him much. And uh, the, thirty uh, seconds. Thirty right. seconds, Frank. Ten seconds, okay. Thirty. Is the young actress Jill Osmond, who is Mrs. Lawrence Olivier. She won't be for long, but when she made this movie, she was married to Lawrence Olivier, and she was actually more famous than he was. Joe, I'll talk to you next week. Thirty-nine steps, Frank. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. That's Frank Delostrito, and we've had a tradition now of like maybe two years, him calling in and having this great author doing film reviews for us. He's a That's fantastic. Bela Lugosi biographer. Oh, okay. Ah, okay. okay. And. Right. Good luck tomorrow night at the Harvard Bookstore. Good Thanks. luck on your tour. Thank, Thank you, Joe. you. We appreciate you coming back. Of course. You coming here for the first time. It was delightful, Joe. Thanks. Views and opinions on visual radio are those of me, 
and my guests. Thank you, Judy Kellerman. Thank you, Gene Martin. Thank you, Sean O'Brien. Thank you, Wincam. Uh, Visual Radio next week. We've got more guests coming in. We've got Gerald Shea coming in in about three weeks from DeCapo Press. Thank you, Lisa Warren at DeCapo. And thank you guys again. That's Visual Radio for Thursday, the 7th.